we wanted to have more than one thing in our pocket, that we didn't just want to do an Elder Scrolls, then an Elder Scrolls, and an Elder Scrolls. We knew we wanted to be in a similar vein in terms of, we wanted open world, we wanted, you know, kind of role-playing elements and things like this, and we made a list of things that we, we might want to do. At the top of the list was Fallout. Fallout 1, to me, is like the pinnacle of the post-apocalyptic gameplay, and, and looking at the story and the characters in there were really inspiring. We felt in that world and the systems they have in Fallout 1, coupled with the way we put things together, we sort of became obsessed, like, th this is the game. We have to make this game. A bunch of the people who run the company knew the people at Interplay, and we. We pestered them and pestered them, like, are you guys using Fallout? They weren't doing anything with it. Can we do something? And eventually they said yes. It's now ours, and we have always taken the approach that Fallout 3 is being made as if we made the first two. Well, that means we do what we do, which is we reinvent, we look at what works, what didn't. We're not afraid to make changes, we're not afraid to try new things, and we're gonna try and sort of move the genre forward and move gaming forward. Our game is set 30-some years after the events of Fallout 2. So we didn't want to step on their fiction, but the story itself is something that we came up with based on the themes of the original Fallout. It's 30 years after the events of Fallout 2, but it's 200 years after the, the original Atomic Holocaust. So in, in, our, in our game, things have actually gotten worse. You know, society hasn't progressed. You know, humanity is struggling to survive. There's radiation sickness, and people don't have fresh, clean water, and like, People are pretty well screwed. You leave the safety of your vault into this world, you know, it's your big decision. Am I gonna help these people or am I gonna, you know, do my own thing and serve my own selfish needs? We felt we needed to do something new with role playing and guns that we couldn't just do a pure first person shooter thing. So how can we kind of bridge that gap between what my character can do that I've made in the game and what I, the player, can do? Something we always wrestle with. Our game is primarily first person. So when you have guns in first person, the bar has been raised. You know, you've got Halo 3, Call of Duty 4, you get to approach that level, but it's tough because we're an, we're an RPG, not a shooter. What we definitely wanted to do with the gun stuff is not do everything that everyone else has done. So, you know, we have some weapons that you can craft and some unique weapons, you know, like the rocket launcher that shoots all the crap you find in the world. It can shoot it as projectiles. One of the things we realized is with Oblivion, most of the combat is melee combat. So everybody's, you know, charging you in, in up close and personal. Not so with guns. People stay back, they take cover. We really had to compensate for that. What we're doing technically with Fallout 3, we're drawing twice as much stuff on the screen and faster, right? So our actual ability to put things on the screen and have them look cool or be cool or do more with characters, explosions, whatever we want. It's, you know, a large factor above Oblivion. Our, our problem is we can't stop ourselves. Uh, Fallout's one of those examples of the game, when we started, was about half the size. I look at the game overall and it's remarkably similar to, you know, what we had envisioned. There are some really big plot points that changed for the better. You emerge from these vaults and you don't know what's happened. So it's the optimism of this retro 50s world, and it's all destroyed. That people are still getting on. They're still trying to do their hair right, and if they had hairspray, they'd use it. And it's like, you know what? Don't look at the destroyed crater and the smoking thing behind me. It's all cool, we'll cool. We'll have some cigars and martinis later. You just managed to get yourself into all sorts of trouble, don't you? That's what I love about Fallout. It doesn't take itself too seriously because the reality is so frightening and so depressing. It feels like you leave that vault and the only thing you take with you is this piece of technology strapped to your wrist that becomes your sort of lifeline. It's that immersion thing, it's keeping you in the game. We're big believers in immersion because ultimately our goal is we want to see productivity decline. We want sick days to go up. We want people staying up until five o'clock in the morning because they had no idea what time it was and they just had to do that one more quest and they got to get up for work in an hour later. I think one of the things that we try to do really well are the worlds that are very, very realized. So for the moments you're in them, the amount of times you say, I wonder if I can, oh, I can. I wonder if I can, oh, I can. It gives you a level of attachment you know, to the person you're playing in the game. Fallout is just such a unique 
wonderful world to explore. I think it fits the kind of games we make perfectly. It's, it's an open-ended environment, lots of characters, really interesting game systems. If you can make whatever the repetitive action is really entertaining, like that's where the rubber meets the road in a lot of these games. So this is something I know the player's gonna do a thousand times. Make that as entertaining as you can, and the rest of it is pretty much great. We had the story written, and, and we had the outlines for all the quests, but then, you know, we have a lot of talented designers here, we wanted to pass that stuff on to them, so they would be given the rough outlines of these, you know, miscellaneous quests, or, and then they would have the freedom to flesh those out themselves. Ah, welcome, weary traveler. You look like a traveler in need of relaxation and the finest of chemical assistance. Design is an iterative process. You need to leave room to change as you go. So having a design doc that thick at the, at the outset is actually not that healthy. I think we did a much better job this time around than we did in Oblivion. We had builds of the game, and we actually themed those builds according to the things we wanted to see in the game. So we had a, a combat build, a creature build. We had a build that was just called Guns. And all the build was about was shooting guns. Like, how do they feel in your hand? And so there was no, it must do this, it must do this, it must do this. It's just about guns. And that kind of will get us on a path of something that is just a lot more fun. We can sit in a meeting for hours and debate, you know, the pluses and minuses of it. And then we'll put it in the game, and in 30 seconds, anybody watching this would go, this is terrible. <laughs> or, great! And you don't have to, sometimes you just overthink it. So we try to force ourselves more to put it in the game and play with it as soon as possible. And you just know instantly. There have certainly been first person RPGs that have had guns before, but I think it's been a while since PC players have had a game like that. On the console side, I think people have been wanting something like that for a long time, you know? Give me a game that has the gunplay of Gears of War or Call of Duty with the depth of an open world RPG. And I hope that eventually, someday, maybe many years from now, that we are just as well known for Fallout as the Elder Scrolls, because right now they are both our, our children. It is so different. It's this weird, like, Tomorrowland gone awry. And that in itself is, is, is gold for someone like me to come in and try to, you know, help create that world. So it's pure escapist entertainment. It's crazy, and you, you try not to get wrapped up on the seriousness of it. There are moments where you, you think about it and you wonder if you're being irresponsible. The good news is the people the game is for get it, but sometimes you talk to people, you know, I'm the worst person at a cocktail party. I mean, you go and they say, oh, what do you do? It's like, I make video games. What kind? The kind where you shoot people? Yeah, kind of. Are they really violent? Like, where's the set? In DC? Oh, that's cute. Yeah, it's all blown up. And then they, they just turn around, they don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> like, that guy's sick. It's the signature of a Bethesda Game Studio game is you're gonna have a big open-ended world. You're gonna be able to walk anywhere you want. If you see something in the distance, you're gonna be able to walk to it and you're gonna be able to open it up and you're gonna find lots of cool stuff there. We've gotten better with our animation stuff is, is leagues above what it was in Oblivion. Our portrayal of characters as realistic people, I think we've gone above and beyond. It's a big world out there, honey, full of all sorts of people. What about you? What sort of person are you going to be? It's very, very interesting that there's a group of people who have hope for what's left of humanity. It's a very compelling story, and the young hero or heroine has to go through a series of, of tests, both ethical and moral, as well as physical, and I, I, I think it's very, very good. Despite the destruction, and despite like how depressing some of the scenes may be, they're, they're a pure charm, and some of those are like violence done in ridiculous manner. And some of those are a line somebody says. Moriarty pisses in his still. Crazy bastard thinks it's hilarious. There are very few ideas that you can't put into a Fallout game. You know, something else that's more serious fantasy, you'd say, eh, wrong flavor. But here, you know, you can have a robot that goes around asking for friends and cutting their heads off or, you know, anything you want to do. Being private and publishing our own stuff lets us take risks that a lot of people can't. We're in a pretty fortunate position of having the time and the creative freedom to do games like this. We sort of feel like we like it a lot and if we execute it well, it'll find an audience that it makes us enough money to do the next game. You have a smaller group of people, they tend to they tend to cling to each other a little more tightly. We tend to believe in each other a little more. 
um, you know, sort of the idea that it's us against the world. No other help is coming. If we're going to get it done, it's going to be the folks here. And when I started in 99, it was, it was a little group of folks. You know, the development team was 10, 12 guys. It was Todd and his small little band working away on Morwen then. Even though we've grown and gotten a lot bigger, I don't think we've lost that feeling. I think that there are enough of us from those days, and, and just about everybody from that first team is still here. Someone was playing and did the Megaton quest, and it was priceless. He just hit the switch, and you see the mushroom cloud in the background. He just sort of sat back in his chair, and he with this big smile on his face. And then he checked his pit boy to check his karma. It said evil. I said, yep, that'll do it. That's a, a pretty big element in the game. When you do something evil, we try to make it very visually entertaining. And then the game tells you, you've lost karma. You're a bad person. That was a lot of the reason we wanted to make it. But it was, oh, this is just so cool. And the pushback that I would get, that's like 10 years old. I'm like, cool is cool forever, man. This is going to be cool 50 years from now. In terms of our design of Fallout 3, we had several goals. Um, one of them was to be true to the original games and to sort of you know, look at those to inspiration, but at the same time updated to gray standards as far as the technology goes, and also just kind of inject a lot more realism and detail that you expect in a primarily first person game. But as far as the aesthetics go, it definitely was a challenge in terms of creating a huge, destroyed, devastated world that was still pretty fun to explore and, and felt like the DC area. I try to draw what I see in my head and the part that I see the clearest I tend to draw first. So I try to make things very story driven and that'll help me when I'm really, really stumped. I'll say, all right, what do I see in my head? And all right, if we got Ward Cleaver and he's kind of scared, but you know, he found some whiskey and a shotgun. All right, you know, things start to coagulate, and I think a lot of times these characters and situations are really, for me, they're found. And I feel like I'm documenting something that I found, and if it's unclear, it's because, well, I haven't quite found it yet. In terms of the art specifically, you know, we were kind of given a lot of liberty to sort of decide how we want to reinterpret the game, because there, there's really so much you can do. You know, jumping up from 64 by 64 pixel sprites to, to full screen things. So, a lot of it was just based on instinct in terms of the artist and, you know, if we're going to redesign a certain character, if we were going to, like, take Mr. Handy and what's the new Mr. Handy going to look like? It's like, you know, we wanted a connection there, but at the same time we wanted to do something new and take it in a new direction, give it, kind of give it a new spin just to make it feel a little more fresh. I have an interest in all things 50s because I think there's a certain charisma with the music, with the automobiles, with the clothing style. Um, uh, the sort of jet set Frank Sinatra rat pack in a flying car with a martini in one hand and he's going to a big band concert. Uh, there's something that's always fun about that. And so designing any of these characters and then throwing them into the wasteland, uh, the dark humor kicked in for me when I imagined Ward Cleaver being pushed out of his bunker and now he's in the wasteland and he's looking for you know fresh tobacco for his pipe and here comes a raider over the, you know the top of the horizon what better kind of thing to draw do you have i mean that's a comic book in itself in the game design there's an underlying tone of humor which is appropriate for the franchise for fallout it's definitely a staple of it how we reflect that in the artwork is also is more subtle but there are little things that for example we were trying to come up with a list of all right what sort of objects and clutter items can we use in our urban landscape in, in DC just to, to fill it up, to clutter it up. And our concept artist Adam came up with, he did a sketch of like a coin operated fallout shelter. It's just like a little steel tube that if you put 50 cents in, go in and close yourself in, you're in a little one person fallout shelter in case the bombs happen to drop when you're out shopping in, you know, in downtown or something like that. And it's, it's a ridiculous idea, but it's thematically very appropriate for sort of like the culture of the time period the uh, 1950s kind of naivete that we were trying to achieve. The world is more focused in that it's a very specific area, sort of DC and sort of the surrounding suburbs. It's a large scale map and it's a pretty huge world, but it's very tight in that it's, it's basically one region. A, it's very cohesive. I was thinking of setting it on the west coast. Um, 
Um, M will really push. Oh, we should we should do it out here. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right Fallout feel, you know. Um, but the more we thought about it, it was, oh yeah, we got to. Who can blow up Washington D.C. better than us? If you look at the Fallout universe, it was necessary to make a split to take the series where we wanted to go with it. You wanted to get away from the West Coast. You wanted to get away from the playground that we knew in one and two. So we came all the way over here. It's what we know. And then there's just a lot of great symbolism in having DC in a post-nuclear landscape. There's lots of great architecture that we all know and love from the area. So it was just a natural fit, I think. I spend a lot of my time on weekends going through DC with a digital camera. And when you're going around the White House taking pictures of manhole covers, uh, people want to know why you're taking pictures of manhole covers around the White House. And I always thought to myself, well, my answer would be very simple. I'm just imagining what this would all look like if it was blown up. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out how the wasteland around here would actually look. Um, and going and visiting buildings they had knocked down in D.C. They, they, no they knocked down a few buildings and we would go and click, 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 click. Um, just to see what destruction down there would look like. For me, uh, a lot of times when you design the architecture, and especially in a sci-fi sense, and then you walk down that street, uh, there's a lot of material for you to play with. Uh, looking at a lot of buildings, I would walk in Adams Morgan and I'd see a cluster of houses and I'd say, wow, that's amazing. All right, we put a lot of chrome flanges on them, but just the configurations of things would give you ideas and one would bounce off of the other. So it was a continuous process. We were able to really stick to the modern vision of DC with just these quirks, this Art Deco stuff, stuff that never existed in our world that would have existed in their world if we extrapolate on what these people and their core values were important to them. So the googie architecture and stuff like that, that all appears. It's there on the sides of the buildings and it's sort of tacked on. So you'll see an ancient neoclassical building that's got metal barricading just sheeted onto the side of it in case of a nuclear strike, like profiteering you know, third-party companies putting the coin-operated vault shelters on the, on the side of the street so you can put a quarter in in case there's a blast and hide in there. Just lots of neat little things like that that we try to do. The landmarks we use and the flavor of it, if you're from around here, there's enough of it where you get it, but not so much that it's any sort of handicap to someone who isn't. And the fact that we kind of had an alternate history helped a lot. So because the Fallout universe splits around 1950, we could take great liberties with DC. So we have all these books in Washington, DC, so that the things that were pre the time when we split, we're careful about after that. You know, if a certain thing was built after that, we try actually not to even have it. Or we'll build it in a different way, in a way that we think suits the game better, and our excuse would be, well, in our timeline, they, they built it different. All the majors are there, right? We've got the Jefferson, plays a big part the Washington, the Lincoln, the Capitol, the White House. Uh, more contemporary stuff like the Air Force Memorial obviously wouldn't be there in their world. But we do try and capture inspirations of some things. We have so much fun doing this. It's like it's almost a guilty pleasure for us. It really is the best job in the world. So it's like you feel kind of guilty in the game or like in the Capitol building fighting super mutants and like, you know, body parts are blowing up. And it's just a big joke. You know what I mean? It's just. It's pure escapist entertainment, it's crazy, and you, you try not to get wrapped up on the seriousness of it. It's a massive world, and there's a lot of small elements that have to be individually created, which will all come together at some point to sort of finish off the spaces, all the cluttering, all the architecture, all the environments, the lighting, the effects. There are so many elements, and that, you know, a lot of it is just kind of, you know, guessing, okay, the, the, whoops. <laughs> that was a big one. You don't need computers. Draw it up. <laughs> Where are you going? Know the triangles this is your frame rate. <laughs> we had some electric storms pass through and uh, basically down power lines, trees went down. It was pretty insane. We uh, lost power for a good, I would say about eight to ten hours. It happened around three o'clock yesterday. Uh, it's a little weird because usually, you know, when it rains around here, we do lose power for like a brief two, three minutes. Uh, so, you know, it was kind of like business as usual, but, but then the power never came back. <laughs> At this point, I don't, I don't see a lot of changes affecting, like, you know, data side. No one should be waiting on that. And if, it, if it's that important, we'll, you know, we'll bring it over. We have a big milestone coming up next week, so that meeting actually was all about how do we get the game ready for this milestone, and, you know, there are people who will stay here as late as they need to and to get stuff done. We've had stuff like this happen before. We've 
put builds on planes and flown people, you know, to save time. It's amazing the things that you'll do to get things done. Uh, when the power went out the other day, uh, a bunch of us went over to the, like, let's get out of here, the power's out. So we went over to the supermarket and the power was out there, but they, they had enough emergency power to run the cash registers. So they're feel free, you can buy whatever you want, but all of the aisles are dark. So we start walking the aisles and I, I you know, do you have like a, you know, the Starbucks bottle thing? I need some coffee. So we start wandering the aisles, it's all pitch black and I'm using my iPhone as like a flashlight. Um, and, I, and I said to one of the guys like, this is how the world ends, man. This is cool. Like we're in the game, like what else should we get? And one guy's like antibiotics, <laughs> you know, like get antibiotics before food. And we're like working it out in the aisle at Safeway just the other day. So yeah, sometimes it creeps in your head. We felt we needed to do something new with role-playing and guns. The original inspiration was, um, imagine Burnout crash mode with body parts. And we talked about it, I and mean, then Emil came up with the name. The acronym is sort of an homage to the, the FEV VATS in Fallout 1. It's, you know, where the super mutants got created from. We were sort of looking for, for an homage, and, and that's just sort of fit the, the vault tech assisted targeting system. Sure, I could shoot a guy in the legs and a running gun, but in VATS, you have a certain amount of action points. So it allows you to actually make a measured, precise shot on the legs, cripple him so he'll move slower, take out the arms, he'll, he'll be less accurate with the gun, the head has a higher chance to critical, so it might blow up, but it's really harder to hit. So really taking all the stuff from Fallout 1 and 2 and sort of trying to bring that into a new next-gen type of game. That was one of our goals initially was, we didn't want to just be a shooter, that the kind of stuff we do, we want to try something that attaches you to your character, that lets you have your character on the screen do something you, the player, can't do. That your character can go in and in VATS, blow the leg off one guy, the head off another, and the arm off another in some equilibrium style, pop, 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 that you, unless you were like Call of Duty Ninja Master, you could never do as a player. It's like we want you to feel super powerful in those moments because your character in the world is super powerful even though you were born with an extra big left thumb or something. Todd's fond of saying that great games are played, not made, and that's certainly true because we knew what we wanted to do with it. We knew we wanted to have the ability to queue up shots at somebody on specific parts of their bodies and then play that back in a cinematic fashion. And that's what we, we knew that we wanted to do. We had talked originally about, you know, let's not have it pause the screen. Let's have it, you know, be a, a, a sort of slow motion thing. And I was like, how many times have you been playing like a first person game and being startled by something and just want to break and just want to be able to stop and assess the situation tactically and pausing the game and, and allowing you to target the body parts allows you to do that. So I'm really happy with the way that came up. We'll put something in with as many dials, tuning things as we can, and then we'd sit there and tune it week by week to, well, now it's more like this. And then people will say, well, how should I be using it? I don't know. Go use it, and then tell us what you think. Um, and the one thing everybody loved were, were the playbacks, you know? When people died in fabulous ways or it showed your character doing something really cool. So we had to separate VATS really into two entities. One was the gameplay part of it, the numbers. What is my character doing when he shoots your arm? What are the numbers? How fast do I get him back? And then there was the playback, which all went to art in terms of being a cinematic joy buzzer. The thing that excites me most is the, uh, the combat, the violence content especially, it is just, it is a fantastic amount of fun to get a, a shotgun and blow a mutant's head off in slow motion and watch the eyeballs go flying all over the screen. The mandate was to push it really far over the top 
We didn't want it to be realistically disturbing. We wanted it to be cartoony. I've done a lot of it. I haven't done it all. Our previous character lead, thankfully, the person who actually scoured websites and found uh, a lot of the photo reference that we wound up having to use. Awful stuff. Don't recommend it. Um, and people were walking by <laughs> and uh, getting very, 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 very sick and telling me that I should, you know, put a warning up. And so I did, because I thought it was funny. I'm a big believer that if you can make, in a game like this, where you're killing lots and lots of things, if you can make that repetitive action really entertaining, like that's where the rubber meets the road in a lot of these games. So this is something I know the player's gonna do 10,000 times. Make that as entertaining as you can, and the rest of it is pretty much great. So we spend a lot of time just on that moment. How does it sound? What is the physics like? What's the camera like? And then, adding lots of cameras so it doesn't get repetitive. I think it really adds something that's really fun and entertaining to the game that we haven't really seen before. Our game is primarily first person, so when you have guns in first person, you, you, the bar has been raised, but it's tough because we're an, we're an RPG, not a shooter. So it's a mixture of, it's not just the player skill, it's your character skill too. Uh, the first thing we did was we took a bow and arrow from Oblivion and we made a bow and arrow gun. <laughs> that shot rapid fire arrows and it didn't quite work right. Uh, so we had to we had to build up that whole system from scratch. Uh, the hardest part has definitely been how you do gun combat within an RPG, how your stats affect your aim, affect your damage. Uh, we've been over that hundreds and hundreds of times, how much the guns spread, how much damage they do, and trying to make you feel like you're getting better as you get more powerful. It's not like Oblivion, you level up automatically. Uh, because it's an experience point based game, so that will happen organically as you play the game. You have different weapon skills too, so a small handgun is determined by the small gun skill. So if you jack that skill up, uh, you know, a small handgun will be pretty damn effective. You know, it, it fires more quickly, you'll get more sh shots off and fast. It's a constant balancing act for us to find that right balance between, you know, RPG skill and player skill and making the guy take long enough to die but have it feel realistic too. The designers made a lot of decisions about what they wanted to do um, in terms of the weapons. We had some fantastical sort of weapons that we made that are fun, like we have a weapon that shoots junk. You just junk, random junk you collect around the world, um, and you just load it up into it, and you can shoot out teddy bears and, you know, and tin cans and typewriters and that sort of thing. But in terms of how to make them work realistically, most of that was just playing the game. Um, we have a lot of numbers, we can adjust the numbers. Um, how fast does this weapon fire? How long does it take to reload it? Um, what sorts of ammo does it take? The animations and all that are all done by the art department, but mostly it's feel in terms of how the weapon works, as opposed to this is exactly how this particular weapon in the real world fires. Um, you want to make it, you know, again, you want to make it fun to play and compelling to play. What we definitely wanted to do with the gun stuff is not do everything that everyone else has done. So, you know, we have some weapons that you can craft and some unique weapons, you know, like the railway rifle that shoots railway spikes, and, you know. So we had a lot of fun with doing that type of stuff. Our lead artist, Estevan, that guy's from Mars, man. He can do anything. And he designed a lot of the guns, the laser rifles. You could build that thing. He knows how it works. It's that part of it that I think maybe people don't see behind the scenes when we, when we concept the stuff, you know. And we know what the knobs do. In the original games, there's actually Pip-Boy, who is the mascot of the device. So the device is Pip-Boy, and there's also a little Pip-Boy guy. It's like your link to survival. It's this device you have that's helping you manage your life. It feels like you leave that vault, and the only thing you take with you is this piece of technology strapped to your wrist that becomes your sort of lifeline. What's really fun is when you just have like your stuff in the Pip-Boy, or you're looking at a stat, and it can be very dry if you just lay them out, lay them out on paper. This is what strength does, this is what intelligence does. And here's this perk called Animal Friend, and it will make animals not attack you. But when you pull it up in the game, that's your Pip-Boy flips up, it's this retro device, and it says Animal Friend, and it has this stupid picture of Vault Boy with like this giant rabbit, and they're just like, you know, like, it's funny. And so um, it makes the, the act of looking at your character stats Another thing the player does all the time, they kill things all the time, and they look at their stats all the time. So you make both those things entertaining. We spent forever on the pit boy. 
compared to the previous projects that I've done here, which was the Elder Scrolls series, where everything is medieval fantasy and, and magic and swords and sorcery and things like that. Fallout 3, everything is rusty and metal and broken. So from a sound perspective, it's a lot more fun because there's a lot of Foley work that I can do that I couldn't do before, including machinery. A lot of the iconic sound that I think of is going to be come from a lot of the voices, but also a lot of the environmental sounds, like the sound of the vault being in the wasteland, in the Enclave military base, and places like that where I got to really put together something different. The vault is very, very sterile. It's a lot of AC noise. It's the sound of being in an office like this, maybe. Everything's very clean and controlled and sterile. But... It's a lot of the voice, I think, um, in particular the robots. And that has more to do with the riders than anybody else because they, they put uh, a lot of work into making each robot very unique. There's the clearly military guy, but it's got a humorous side to it. And we've got the uh, Mr. Handy robot, who is British butler inspired, but not so much C-3PO as he is Basil Fawlty from Fawlty Towers. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Godfrey, your personal robotic butler. And so that kind of stuff I think in particular is what's gonna stand out to people and what they're gonna remember. Good work. That's one less round roads to deal with. Let's get a picture together. Capture the moment. Most of the casting was actually done here, just right in over here in our little booth. There was a little bit done in LA as some of the bigger names like Liam Neeson. There you go. My goodness, just a year old and already walking like a pro. On video games, you have to rely a lot on your voice if you're not going to be seen, you know, so. Um, and over the years, I've done quite a, a lot of, maybe not video work, but I've done a lot of uh, audio work. And, and in my early days, a lot of radio plays with the BBC in London, in Ireland. So I've, there's, there's a shift of focus you do have to make, you know, and trying to convey something through your voice and through uh, the rhythm of the words that you wouldn't have to worry about so much if the camera was on you, you know. Come on over here, son. Come on, walk to daddy. There you go. My goodness, just a year old and already walking like a pro. Your main character, you know, an authoritative character, obviously President Eden, um, it's self-explanatory. Old minds are like old horses. You must exercise them if you wish to keep them in working order. The government should not be guided by temporary excitement, but by sober second part. You know, I love doing video games and, and stuff like that, so because I've got kids, so of course they always love that. I guess I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy it. Don't you, my darling America, deserve that? Don't you deserve a future free of war and fear and terrible uncertainty? Of course you do. Malcolm McDowell in particular has done lots of VO work in video games before. He just kind of jumped in, we did a little bit of background on the character, and then he just started having fun with it. And it was great because it seemed like he was relaxed and having fun and he knew he wanted to ad-lib some stuff or go a little crazy with some of the lines. It's good that way because it almost seems to me that video game acting is kind of like makeup for a stage performance. You kind of have to exaggerate things a little bit. When they go a little bit more over the top sometimes, it seems like what you and I would consider normal in a film. Whereas when you hear it just by itself, you're like, man, I don't know, that's gonna, that's gonna stand up like a sore thumb. But in the context of the game, it's great. So I felt like that's what Malcolm McDowell brought to the project as well. You're simply existing, America. Postponing death for a day or two. Well, I'm gonna tell you, right here, right now, those days are at an end. The Enclave is back, America. We've brought clean water with us. We have everything from a BB gun to the plasma rifle. Not to forget the fat man, the miniature nuclear bomb launcher. when you fire it. It's this blast of pressurized air and rattly metal, and it's got a stupid dinner bell ring that I put on it when it's ready to fire the next round. Energy weapons were much, much harder. Those were the hardest of the bunch. 
there's not a lot out there in terms of stock recordings to start from or any starting point. A lot of the stock recording stuff sounds really bad. It's easy to make something sound silly. It's really hard to make it sound like this is a really powerful weapon and I'm doing a lot of damage with it and not just have it be pew pew pew, you know, or something like that. Hey, well, I'll actually start with the stock, with the weapon recordings, in fact. But I'll take uh, the low end of this one. This, this one has a real heavy, boom, low end slap, you know, that you're gonna hopefully feel in your chest every time you shoot it. And then the high end of this one, and then a little bit more of it is foleyed. So I'll show you a few of the items I've got here. This is the booth where we normally record all the voice actors. And so it's usually just one voice actor in the chair, script in front of them, and then the mic, and then me in the other room directing. But I also use this room for a lot of the in-house Foley recording that I do. And a lot of it is not necessarily something that I, I know right away what I want to record for the game. Uh, like there's a specific robot or a specific uh, gun or any kind of thing like that. Usually it's something at the beginning of the project and I'll come in, uh, find a bunch of props, whatever I think I can find from uh, construction sites around the office, stuff like that, things off the loading dock, and just record making every little sound. I bang on things, I bend it, and uh, file it all away in our sound effects library for later. And then as the game progresses, as I need to find something to use that sound in, then it's on hand and then hopefully I've got it organized and named in such a way that I can uh, find it when I need it. So one uh, thing I found during this project was uh, I got one of these five gallon water jugs from one of the nice folks up in QA. And uh, I just found if I kind of inserted the neck of the bottle without hitting the microphone and you get this massive kind of real deep chest bass sound if you just tap it very very lightly on the bottom so I've got a few of the some of the bullet shells that you're going to hear on the game this is a 30-06 so you might hear some of these when the sniper rifle whereas we used some of the smaller caliber pistol ammunition like a 9mm which was actually used on the 10mm but don't tell anybody that. Classic Fallout sound, bottle caps. So every time you get bottle caps off of somebody or give them bottle caps or just pick them off a dead body, you're gonna be hearing these. And these are uh, just a different assortment of beers that I drank and saved up. And so uh, it's basically just me passing them from one hand to the other, and that's about it. This is an ordinary uh, wrapper from like a snack pack kind of cereal and uh, Captain Crunch or Cheerios or what have you. And this is the sound of the giant ants in the wasteland. A lot of the sound they make when their feelers are out or when they're moving around, they're looking for something, I don't know, kind of squeaky, a little plasticky sounding. And I'm basically just taking this thing and then scrunching it all together. It makes all these little squeaks and rips and tears and stuff like that. So it's a lot of that mixed with other pieces of plastic and uh, clear wrap and uh, liquids and things like that for the ants. Some of the weapons, a lot of them are me just banging on HVAC ductwork. Anything where I can get a big metal, you know, when it fires. A little bit of that is in the double barrel shotgun. You're listening to Enclave Radio. I'm John Henry Eden, president of the Enclave, president of America. And that was something I had to figure out very early on was the sound of anyone uh, being broadcast over the radio. So uh, sound-wise, there's that, because the rest of the sound, it takes place in the, the modern day of Fallout 3, which I can then go back to making it sound as post-apocalyptic and wrecked as I wanted to make it sound. 